So good morning. I'm Jim, in case you forgot me already. That was a bad joke. There was something else I was supposed to say, and now I don't remember, so we'll dive into Galatians, shall we? Thank you to Andrew for last Sunday. <coughs> he did a bang-up job. He did wonderful, and, and I appreciate wherever he, oh, he's back there chatting with people online. So we be, when I began this series, it was a long two weeks ago, I said that Galatians is spiritual dynamite. And a tiny stick of dynamite can blow up a building. And Galatians, therefore, is a dangerous book. You've got to read it at your own risk. And so this morning I want to add to that and say, you know, Paul, it didn't take him very long to light the fuse in this book. The proper way to begin a letter in Roman times was with some thanksgiving, with some acknowledgement of your audience. But the false pre teachers were spreading a false gospel throughout Galatia, and that gospel so burdened Paul that he, he breaks the proper rules of etiquette as he opens this book. He's the parent standing there at the, at the curb as the kid's trying to run into the street and saying, stop, stop, there's a car. You don't say, oh, my dearest child, would you please stop? You know, you hear some urgency there. And that's the tone you get as this letter begins. And he, he is so concerned for their spiritual welfare that he jumps right in to the heart of his letter. And he begins to light the fuse. And as he does, he does three things, okay? This is a complicated sermon for me. I mean, you'll see. There's a lot of points and subpoints. So big picture, he's doing three things. He's clarifying what's the problem in Galatia. He is issuing a warning to these believers. And then third, he is, he is exposing the motives of what's really going on inside Galatia. And this isn't just about them. It's about us. He clarifies, you know, you all have a problem with the gospel. Here's your problem. And then he gives us a warning. He says, beware about what you think, what's going on uh, in and within us as believers. And then he exposes our motives and what's really going on with us. And so he does three things. And the first thing he does is the problem that we face. Number one, the problem we face. We are prone to leave grace behind. We are prone to leaving the grace of Christ behind us. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. He begins with this little phrase, which is really the meat of the letter. I'm astonished. I'm amazed at you guys. See, Paul and Barnabas, they had just invested their lives. They had traveled, you know, to Galatia, to central Turkey. And they had planted churches on this first missionary journey to the region. And he's like, I am just astonished that what we just taught you, you're, you're easily found prey to false teachers. I mean, hadn't he taught them the truth? Hadn't they gladly listened? Were, were not they liberated by the truth of the gospel? How could they be so quickly deceived? But we all face the same problem, do we not? We are all prone to leave grace. It's made it in our, into our hymnology, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We need to ask a couple of questions about turning from this grace, turning from this gospel. I mean, what do we learn about leaving grace behind? What's that involved? And second question is, what happens when we do leave that grace behind? So the first question he asks, letter A, I never have A's. What do we learn about leaving grace behind? Well, we learn three things, Paul says. Number one, we say leaving grace behind, Paul says, is a big deal. This isn't just some minor thing. It's a big deal. He says, I am astonished that you are what? Deserting. They are switching teams. The word deserting, it's a military term. It means basically becoming a traitor. 
You leave your one army of your own country and you're going to fight for a different country. Can you imagine a Cowboys fan wearing a commander's t-shirt? It doesn't, I struggled with that illustration because you, I want to say Redskins, but because that's the image I still have. Sorry. More close to home, closer to home. Can you imagine a diehard Trojan? And I don't even need to finish it, do I? Can you imagine a Red Sox fan wearing a Yankee cap? All right, they're switching teams. However, here in Galatians, this is actually a serious issue. This isn't just some crosstown rivalry. Paul is astonished to think that the Galatians, who had heard the truth of the gospel, have put on a different jersey. They had come to Christ. They had put on the robes of righteousness. And now they're turning back to the dumpster where their old filthy clothes had been put, and they want to pull them back out and put them on, this works-based religion. And it hurt Paul because he saw them as his spiritual children. Later in this letter, he's going to write in chapter 4, verse 19, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth. It's bad enough to give birth to a kid once, so I hear. To do it again. He's in agony. He wants them to grow in Christ-likeness. He wants them to turn, uh, to, to know that they're turning it is anything but insignificant. And the passion of Paul should remind us that truth is important. It matters. When someone's turning away from Christ, it should grieve us. Someone walking on the gospel of grace, when they do that, it should thrill us. John will later write, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Truth is important. Leaving grace is a big deal. Second thing we learn from the text is that leaving grace can happen very quickly. Verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting. I think of the golden calf incident in Exodus 32. Moses is up on the mountain. He hasn't been seen in a while. So what, what's the thing to do? Well, let's be, make our own God. Of course, that's a natural thing. They've just been freed from Egypt. They got the covenant, the law. And Moses goes away to speak with God. And so they make something else in place of their Redeemer. Put yourself in Paul's sandals. You go out and you start these churches. You have personally faced hardship to do so. And you've gone up and down the mountain to get to these places. And you face danger. You've been left for dead in some of these places. And you see people coming to Christ and churches planted. But then after they're established, they begin to wander. And you hear that those new believers, they're turning away from the faith. So how do you respond? In this letter, you'll hear his frustration. Chapter 5, verse 2, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Chapter 3, verse 1, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified. And this letter, it's probably written within a year after he planted these churches and had been there. They did this so quickly. And the third thing about leaving grace is that leaving grace is not hopeless. It's not hopeless. It says, he writes, deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. The situation was bad, but it was not without some hope. The word turning, it's in the present tense. You can, maybe we're making too much of the present tense. But, but they're in the process of this. This wasn't a settled act and decision that they had made. They're in the process. This turning is, is they're making the turn. And the good news is if you faithfully contend for the faith, you can maybe turn it back around. You could be corrected. Paul could correct them. You got friends who are drifting. Don't give up. As long as they're still breathing, there is contending that can still happen for the faith. 
What do we learn about leaving grace behind? It's a big deal. It can happen quickly, but it's not hopeless. The second thing is a question. The second question is, what happens when you begin to leave grace behind? That's what, that's what, that's what it, it is. Now, what, happen, what are you doing? What in reality is going on? And, and three things are going on. Number one, you're turning from God himself. You want a different gospel? You know what's really going on? You're turning away from God himself. Verse six, you are so quickly deserting who or what? The one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. You are not turning from a set of principles. You are turning from him. You're turning away from God. You're turning from the one who has just been described in verse, in verse 4 as the one who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Today, you hear things, people say things like, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I got no interest in the Bible. I'll take the Jesus, but not the Bible. That, that statement reveals that somebody wants to hold on to God, but they are abandoning the gospel the very good news that comes from that God. They want to know God, but they don't accept this notion of God punishing his son in our place. And that kind of a dismissive approach is not going to work. When you turn from the gospel, you turn from God. They're wrapped up together. When you're leaving grace, you're leaving God. Disbelieving the gospel it's worse than, than being Bill Buckner in his infinite miss as first baseman for the Red Sox, had a great reputation, 1986 World Series. He lets a ground ball go between his legs in game six of the World Series. So the Red Sox lose the game, and then they lost game seven to the Mets. You know, don't let the gospel slip between your legs. You could eventually lose, you know, like the, like the Red Sox did. Grab hold of it. Second, what else is happening if you turn away, from, if you leave grace? You have nowhere else to go. Grace is it, folks. Verse 6, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. You're turning to a different way of, of, of the good news, but that's really not good news. It's no gospel at all. The false teachers in Galatia have no good news. They have no gospel at all. There's only one gospel. You let it slip away and it's gone. The point is there's no other way to be right with God. There's no other way to experience forgiveness apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is very difficult for us to, to acknowledge and to embrace in this exclusiveness of the gospel because we live in a sea drowning of religious pluralism. Finding a right relationship with God, it's not like picking a deodorant. You can choose from a number of antiperspirants. They might keep you fresh. But that's not the case if you want to secure eternal life. There's only one path to God. There's only one that works. And Jesus has no equal. He's not one among many religious leaders. He is the one and only Messiah. There's nowhere else to turn if you reject it. And the third thing that ha is happening in this is what you're really doing if, if you add on these works to the gospel is you attempt to reverse the gospel of grace. You're trying to turn it around. He says in verse 7, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to, here's the key word, pervert the gospel of Christ. These false teachers, they change or they pervert or they distort the gospel. That's a very strong word. This is a radical change they're making. They're, they're like turning water into blood or, or seawater into fresh water. It's the change between darkness and light. Some say it's better to translate that word as reverse. They're reversing the gospel. And what do I mean? I mean that there's an order to the gospel. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. 
For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. There is a proper order to the gospel. Saved by grace alone, saved for good works. And we do not receive grace after we've received, after we've worked for salvation. That would be reversing the gospel. If a person says, I'm going to do enough good things to be right with God, I'm going to merit what, what my salvation is, you have officially reversed the gospel. You've put what is in the back in the front, and you've perverted it. How do false teachers do that today? It's not that difficult. We teach sometimes, people teach, either through a false religious system or through some myth that they believe that's common to our culture, that you earn your eternal life by your goodness or your works. One such myth says you need to believe in God, but that God just might not be involved in your life. You just need to be good. Because if you feel good, you're okay. If a person can believe in a God and basically do good things, they will conclude, okay, that guy goes to heaven. And that's popular, but it does not reflect the gospel. And some might object to, to that narrow view of truth. They'll say something like, well, my friend's a Buddhist. He's a nice guy. He's a moral guy. His family is polite. To which I'd say, I'm not denying that. They might be really nice people. He's a moral guy. But what I deny is that morality can get you to heaven. Morality can keep you out of jail, but it cannot get you to heaven. It cannot keep you out of hell. Because if morality could save you, Jesus didn't have to die. Just be moral, just be good. And we shouldn't complain that there's only one way to heaven. We should marvel at the fact that there is any way at all. Stand in awe of the reality that despite our sin and rebellion, God sent his son to rescue us. And it is through him that he is the way, the truth, <clears throat> and the life. And through him we experience saving grace. There is only one alternative to the works-based salvation system. And that is the righteousness of Christ given by God, by grace alone, through faith alone. So that's the problem we face. There's only one gospel, he says. So now he, he, there's a warning. Number two. I know, it's complicated, I told you. Two and three are shorter. You're welcome. <laughs> Number two. The warning that we all need. They need it, we need it. And that is this, it is dangerous to leave grace behind. That's what it means to leave grace behind. But there's a warning here. You better, you know, there's a danger to leaving grace behind. Verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. In case you missed it the first time, he says it again. These are some of the strongest words in the New Testament. Let them be under God's curse. Some translations will say accursed. It's friendly from the, from the word meaning, from the word anathema, which comes from the Hebrew idea of being devoted to destruction. It means to reject something completely and you condemn it to destruction. And Paul says anyone, including himself, who preaches a gospel other than the gospel of the free grace of God should be eternally condemned. He's essentially saying they can go to hell. The curse reminds us of the sobering responsibility anyone has who teaches and who teaches anyone. He says, if anybody, in verse 9, 
This warning reminds us of the centrality of the gospel. This curse shows us that the gospel must remain the priority in Christian leadership. And therefore, we always need to ask this question about our teachers. Are they preaching the gospel? Are they teaching clearly the gospel? It's a key question. It's a question I ask a lot these days. As I realize more and more, anybody who's in my role, they are an interim. Nobody's permanent. So what comes next? And when the day of transition arrives, will that person preach the pure, uncursable, I made that word up, uncursable gospel? It's a huge question. Paul will say in this letter to the Philippians that we can preach the gospel out of wrong motives, but at least the gospel's preached. Preach the truth. His main concern is the purity of the message not the motive of the person preaching, because the gospel alone saves. So the message is very important. Why? Because the glory of Christ is at stake. False gospels will always glorify man because they boast in our human achievement. Do this, and you'll get that. But the real gospel boasts only in Christ and what he's done. And the message of the gospel is so essential because the souls of men and women for eternity are at stake. And so Paul writes this letter to the Galatian believers. And let's be honest, these are not very South Bay official words. These are not words you hear in PV, not very often, because here we want to talk about tolerance and diversity and pluralism, that secular trinity. You don't hear much about people going to hell. The notion that a person would declare that someone else was deserving of hell is something only a narrow-minded bigot would say. I am a narrow-minded bigot. But these are the words we read in Galatians chapter 1, coming from a man who wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What Paul says, God says. And here is a clear rejection of the rampant pluralism, the notion that all religions are equal, and in the end, it'll all just wash and head to the same place. These are not very popular verses, but they are as true today as when the apostle wrote them 2,000 years ago, and his main thing in in this sentence is, be warned, beware. He's clarified the problem. He's warned us about the problem. So let him open up our hearts and do some surgery. Let's look at what he says about this ongoing battle for the gospel. He explores our motives. Number three, the question I must answer, am I a people pleaser or a servant of Christ? Verse 10, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, apparently, some thought that Paul avoided preaching circumcision. If you just don't talk about circumcision, then, you know, they'll they'll come to Christ. They, They saw that as a watering down of the gospel. He wanted to gain their favor, so ignore circumcision, which not a bad plan. But... He has no interest in pleasing people. His goal is to please God by doing what? By preaching the pure gospel. Paul wrote as he did because he cared for these people, not because he wanted to gain their favor. His goal was pleasing God by preaching the true gospel. And he wrote as he did because he cared so much for them. He loved them. So he dared to tell them the hard truth. Salvation's by grace. You don't have to do anything. It would have been easier if he just, you know, overlooked the issue. Make it a mild warning. Eh, Maybe someday you'll want to get circumcised. But he didn't take the easy way out. Why not? Because he cared more for the approval of God than the approval of men. So he spoke the truth. We should all be as bold to speak the truth today. Because if your goal in life is to be liked, you will not be faithful 
or fruitful as a believer. Now, I'm not implying that you should be a jerk. I'm merely pointing out that the followers of Jesus were just like him in that they experienced opposition as he did. And if people despised our Savior, and they did, they will despise you if you follow him. Our goal isn't to be cool. Our goal is to be faithful. Who do you want to please? Whose approval matters most? Proverbs 29, 25, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Fear carries the idea of reverence and standing in awe, really, of worshiping. So if we're going to seek the approval of people, that becomes in our lives idolatry. If we're being consumed by what everybody thinks about us, we're worshiping people, not God. That old hymn captures, or the gospel song captures the spirit. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. Are you a servant of Christ? Do you adore him in all your heart? Do you recognize the grace that he's given you and the death he endured for you? Are we willing to contend for a pure and simple message with courage and with power of the spirit that's ours in Christ? Do not now leave the grace of Christ. That's his appeal. So let me wrap up our time this morning with a couple of truths. Next Sunday, we're going to do a marathon. I'm going to make up lost ground. We're going to start in verse whatever I dropped off, uh, finish through 10 today. We're going to start in verse 10, and we're going to go all the way through the end of chapter 2. <laughs> Take your energy drinks. Eat a big breakfast. No, this is the biographical section, which is all very, very important to the argument of the book. So, yeah, let's not preach it yet. But a couple of things to consider this morning. They seem obvious, but they bear repeating. Number one, this is not in your notes, I don't think. I don't remember. I made the notes a really long time ago, so there you go. Number one, even well-taught Christians may unintentionally follow false doctrine. We got all got to listen to this. This isn't just something that happened just in Galatia. We need to hear these words because you may be deceived, even though you're well taught and well granted. Take nothing for granted, angel. Uh, angel, um, Satan will disguise himself as an angel of light. Be on guard for your friends, for new believers around you. If Paul's new converts could be deceived, you don't think you can be deceived, and I can be deceived. Number two, not everyone who claims to be a Christian is telling the truth, especially on TV. I'm just saying that I never watch, so what do I know? Not TV, but Christian TV. Now I'm in trouble. Not everyone who claims to be a Christian is telling the truth. There's an obvious truth that we need to repeat today. Jesus warned about people who work miracles, who claim to be his followers, and on the day of judgment, he's going to say what to them in Matthew 7? I never knew you. Away from me. What were you doing? Do not take these words lightly. Consider the thought that these words might someday be directed at us. Before we point the finger, make sure we're not, we're not people and among people who claim to be something that they're not. And number three, God still pronounces a curse on anyone who adds anything to the simplicity of the gospel of the free grace in Christ. Not a popular statement, but it's exactly what Paul's point is here. Anyone who preaches a gospel other than the gospel of the New Testament is under a curse from God. That's not a place to, good place to be. There's only one gospel. There's only one savior. There's only one way of salvation. Let, let those who preach any other gospel and any other salvation or way of, 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 of coming to know God, don't listen to them. If they won't repent, 
If they won't turn from that teaching, they're eternally condemned. Don't listen to them. That's the word of God. This is what he says about false teachers. So where does this leave us? Well, one thing's clear so far in Galatians. Your relationship with Christ makes all the difference in the world. Ultimately, nothing else will matter. We have to run to the cross as the only hope for salvation. You don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to be baptized. We run to the cross, and the question then we have to ask as we see that God is satisfied with what his son did, is Jesus enough for you? Is he enough? Or do you got to add something to your faith in Christ? I urge you to humble yourself. Turn from your pride, bow your knee before the one who loved you enough to die for you and trust in Christ as being enough. Do it today if you've never done it. He's enough. He doesn't ask you to do anything else. This passage calls us to stand strong for the gospel. The good news, the message of what Christ has done. And I realize that we live in an age when anyone who expresses a strong opinion or, you know, or or anything, you know, is is liable to be ridiculed and they could call us narrow-minded. So be it. Let us be as narrow as the truth of God is narrow and as broad as the grace of Christ is broad. All truth is narrow. You, you, we all go to the bank. Nobody goes to a bank where they add two plus two and they get three. They're not going to do well with your money. That's, that's true narrow-mindedness. Two plus two is four, and you want to go and make sure that they can do that. Not five, not even four and a half. We desire that quality in the lesser management or the lesser matters of finance, but we condemn it in matters of faith? Really? Thank God for this emergency letter to the Galatians. It reveals the heart of the gospel. And he calls us to be faithful to what's truly revealed in the New Testament. And we thank God that the finished work of Christ is truly finished. There's nothing left for you to do. So let us join together with true believers everywhere and declare the free grace of God. Is this the message that the world needs to hear? It is. And may God deliver us from the fear of man. That we, are ever, that we will never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Share it. Believe it. Tell it to someone this week. They don't have to do anything. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this letter to the Galatians is a stick of dynamite in the modern world. I pray we understand that. And I pray that we will return in our lives. We we always just want to add stuff. But you love us no matter what we do. That we might be a people who believe in the free grace of Jesus Christ. It's free. And we will share that forever. And if we've never come to that place in our lives, I pray that today, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you might draw us all near to you. And those who've never believed in the free grace of Christ might do so today. Then we might decide to follow you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.